Welcome to Italics, television for the Italian-American experience. I'm your host, Anthony Tamburri. On this episode, Dr. Joseph Shora will interview Madalena Marinari, Associate Professor of History at Gustavo Adolphus College, about her new book, Unwanted, on Immigration Laws Between 1882 and 1965. Let's join them now. <laughs> Welcome, Madalena, to the Galandra Institute's uh, italics presentation. I appreciate the opportunity. This is exciting. Unwanted, an exciting overview of this really complicated history that has pertinence for today. You're looking at the period of 1882 to 1965 and looking at immigration to the United States, the increased push to limit immigration and maybe even stop it. But in particular, which, which I, I find really intriguing about the book, is the ways in which uh, Italians and Jews in the United States um, struggled and fought back against those kinds of restrictions. These are two groups that started arriving, Italians and Eastern European Jews, at the end of the 19th century. For a lot of Americans of uh, Northern and Western European descent, they're dramatically different than all the immigrants who have come before. And they're almost immediately perceived as a threat from a cultural point of view, uh, political, religious. Religion is a plays a big role. But also, it's because they have this dramatically different stories. On one hand, Eastern European Jews who come as families, settle permanently, and naturalize as soon as possible. On the other hand, you have Italians who at the beginning are uh, overwhelmingly male, but also keep traveling back and forth, and they're really, really reluctant to naturalize, and also have incredibly high rate of return, right? But this different history also affects how they're mobilized against immigration restriction. And for in the case of Eastern European Jews, um, even though there is a lot of tension with the older, more established Jewish community of German descent, in the end, that turns out to be an asset, at least at the beginning, right? Because they have kind of a, an infrastructure, but also the connections that they might need. So at least at the beginning, it provides them a voice much sooner than in the case of Italians, right? Italians are still becoming Italian in a way, right? They become more Italian once they're here in the United States than when they're in Italy. And so Italians lack the infrastructure, so there, is, there are no big organizations. There isn't a group of prominent politicians that can put forward. So they have to start from scratch. But what's interesting um, is that the Jewish visibility eventually becomes an issue because uh, repeatedly during the entire period that I study, the immigration problem is referred as the Jewish problem. And so from the very beginning, Jewish activists understand that one of the biggest things that they can do is to collaborate with other immigrant groups. They frame their battles, so to speak, as for all immigrants, right? We don't want any discrimination. Uh, Italians, turns out, and perhaps because of fewer means and more infighting, they become very pragmatic. It's like, we will collaborate with you only if it will advance. We know that there's the Naturalization Act of 1790, right, which restricts citizenship of uh, immigrants to free white males. And there is also the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. The U.S. laws are allowing immigration coming from Europe, um, seeing those folks as white, but to some degree, their whiteness is 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 problematic. They're kind of not quite white enough, even though they are allowed to become citizens, own property, uh, marry other whites. Italians and Eastern European Jews, along with Asian, especially uh, Chinese immigrants, were part of the still the largest global migration in the world, right? And one of the destinations was the United States, although not the only one. But what you see is that even though there were a little over 100,000, only a little over 100,000 Chinese, passing restriction against Chinese immigration happens fairly quickly compared to what happens to European. But they don't exclude everyone, right? There's the intersection of race and class, right? Merchants, students, diplomats can still come in. And in fact, people operate at two levels. One, they make these comparisons with non-white immigrants when it comes to Italians and Eastern European Jews, but then they, they say, we have a citizenship crisis. 
This crisis is as serious as the one that we had at the end of the Civil War, right? So now they're bringing African Americans in and saying, are these really the people that we want to become our future citizens, right? And that's why at first there is an obsession with checking the quality of these new immigrants, right? They can be sick, they can be poor, they can be criminal, they have to have certain political ideology. What they're really trying to do is to build an argument for those Americans who still feel uncomfortable with the idea that you, you can restrict other Europeans. That completely changes with the outbreak of World War I. All bets are off. All of a sudden, that, that's, that's really the smoking gun, so to speak, that a lot of Americans needed between the issues of uh, loyalty and that's where it's a big problem for Italians, right? Because they really have low naturalization rates. People start saying they're going to be, we're going to have even more uh, immigrants who are poor and illiterate and are not going to really appreciate American democracy and will be terrible uh, citizens. People will have children. So it's not just about them. We have to pay attention to, right, the second, the third, the fourth generation. Even though there is no doubt that these two groups, right, were never um, completely um, restricted, and they figured out, right, that naturalizing was actually one important difference that they had with Chinese, for example, when they couldn't naturalize. That didn't stop restrictionists from trying to make an argument that, yes, they might be white, but it's just not the right kind, and we should make sure that we have only uh, the best of them and as few as possible. Your mention of children, um, descendants of these immigrants, uh, brings to mind um, the whole issue of eugenics, which reminds me of the Immigration Restriction League. They're almost sort of like a think tank, right? They're major proponents of immigration restriction coupled with notions of eugenics. And they, as I learned from your book, become a very powerful influencing force within Congress. The structure in Congress, so to speak, is changing, right? Uh, now laws are proposed and debated and uh, first approved in committees. So it's an even smaller number of people that has an incredible, incredible amount of power. And these committees increasingly relies, quote unquote, on experts, like people like us, right? Lodge, for example, was a member of the Immigration Restriction League. He's the one who pushed for the literacy test. And so his presence and his passion for immigration restriction somewhat made sense. But what I found puzzling at first is why there are so many, so many uh, Southern senators where there are very few Italians and Eastern European Jews who all of a sudden start embracing immigration restriction as part of their agenda. And I think this is important for today too. So one side, right, embraces eugenics, is very outspoken about the threat and the damage that these new immigrants will uh, do. But then the Southerners is like, why are they? And so one of the other changes that happens is that African Americans become citizens. These Southern politicians feel threatened in their power and they identify immigration as the wedge issue that will allow them to retain power and build seniority. And that seniority will also help block, for example, civil rights legislation or foster segregation and disenfranchisement. So the issue um, of family to me was really, really fascinating, though, because on one hand, right, you have all these restrictionists, all these politicians and lobbyists that really believe that Italians and Jews will water down, the, quote unquote, the American race. But then what I find fascinating is that there is a limit to that. They felt comfortable enough setting quotas. They felt comfortable enough with putting real, a lot of limitations on what these immigrants should be doing and should look like. But they also believed that you shouldn't separate families. This has really changed now, right? Even that now is no longer untouchable. You talked about the um, what's going on in Congress. And, you know, many of us know about the Immigration Act of 1924. There was this big restrictive law that sets in the quotas that lasts 
more or less up until 1965. But you know, looking through your book, I saw that there was a series of acts, immigration um, acts, uh, restricting uh, people coming in, 1903, 1907, 1917, 1921. I mean, people don't normally understand that there was this constant attack on immigration through legislation that's going on before this climatic change in 1924. A hundred years ago, you didn't necessarily need a passport or a visa or a medical visit. So these are things that between 1882 and um, 1875 and 1924, they're all built into the system. And so uh, you check on your political ideology, whether or not you can come in with a job uh, secured already, right? The contract labor law. What, what constitutes physical and mental fitness? Uh, there's also this gray area of crimes of moral turpitude. My students always have a field day with that one because it's so nebulous. 1924 is possible because by 1924, you have immigration stations that have been set up. You can really see the progression that they're trying to find the best possible way to control immigration. There's also the realization that you could stop immigrants from leaving altogether, right? And so there is also the emergence of remote control where you start asking sending countries. And Italy at first really wants to work with uh, the U.S. government. Like, tell us what you want, right? Do you want to do medical inspections? Do you want passports, visas, background checks? They'll do anything. And so there are several attempts Right? And every time that a new law passes, for example, during World War I, requires a literacy test to say, okay, this is it. This is the one that is going to solve all of our problems. It's going to cut immigration. And so the literacy test is really interesting. Jews are known as the people of the book for a reason. It's because they have high literacy rates. And even Italians, by 1917, because they had this literacy test that had been talked about for so long, they learn enough, right, to pass the test. And so there is endless frustration that these legislators, every time they think they figured it out, and then there are loopholes around it. The culmination is really 1921 and 1924, where we say, okay, we're going to think of the most restrictive law that we possibly can. The way that they got to those numbers for the quotas is important because if you look at the debates, it's like we don't want to repeat the mistake that we made with Chinese. Making it blatantly about race actually caused a lot of problems because Chinese kept going to court. So Italians were not entirely wrong by that they decided to go to court. It's just that they just didn't have the financial means. And 1924 is one of about 20 different bills that had been uh, proposed. And that doesn't really stop until not even in the 1930s, right, and 40s. I think it's important, um, particularly for Italian Americans, to know about this history because all too often in, in our current uh, conversations about immigration, one often comes across Italian Americans who say, well, my great grandparents came here legally when the laws were rather complicated. And sometimes there, as you say, were no laws and you didn't even need a passport at a certain point. So the restrictions don't, I mean, for the 1880s, 1890s, the restrictions are rather limited. Being legal was a lot easier 100 years ago than it is today. The restrictions just keep coming, right? What immigrants can and cannot do and uh, when. But a lot of that was tested on uh, Italians and Jews, right? Because essentially the immigration bureaucracy balks at the creativity of these immigrants to get around the rules in order to get in. My next book will be about undocumented uh, Italians. Are Italians taking over the number of Chinese coming in illegally, right? So even though this story is not as visible today, it was there and people were very worried and they were trying to find ways to stop them. So just because people are not open about how they came into the country, it doesn't mean that it did not happen. But I also think that this historical amnesia, right, doesn't help anyone. Just like 100 years ago, that system was not sustainable, nor is the one that we have today. 1924, right, is known as the most uh, restrictive draconian law in uh, U.S. immigration history until recently. But immigration continued. 
If you look at the number of immigrants that came into the United States in the 1930s, those numbers keep going up. And in part, they go up because of family reunion, but there are also other immigrants uh, from south of the border or north of the border who are brought in to work, right? So clearly there is a gap between the laws, the rhetoric, and the reality. You mentioned this historical amnesia, right? And I think it, um, it's rather prevalent within the Italian-American community um, for their understanding of uh, Italian immigration. I, I'm always struck from everything from as casual as social media or to other scholarly readings, um, noting the number of Italians who are arriving in the 1930s after this, you know, restriction. Right. And I'm always wondering, well, how, you know, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about the quota mm -hmm. and, and what it meant um, both for Eastern European Jews and for Italians. Um, I mean, it was incredibly limited, something like a little bit over 3,000 people a year. Right. Um, Yet all these people are still, all these Italians are, are still immigrating in the 1930s. A lot of the people who come in the 1930s come through a uh, family reunion. So even though the quota was not very high compared to uh, before the quota system, um, and those quotas were filled really, really quickly, family members were coming outside of the quotas. One of the things that I find fascinating is there are a lot of unintended consequences uh, when it comes to uh, immigration laws. It's a, the same thing in 1952, right? 1952 is supposed to reaffirm that the United States is an isolationist country that wants as little immigrants as possible. McCarran absolutely hates Italians. Senator Pat McCarran of Nevada, the boss of Nevada, they called him. And so on the surface, right, the 1952 law is as bad as the 1924 law, but because it formalizes the family reunion and skill preference, the numbers for the rest of the decade of immigration actually go up. Post-World War II is a very different period than uh, what led up to 1924. You have, you have the war itself, you have the Shoah, you have all these displaced people, um, refugees, and there's, as you indicate in your book, there's all these um, laws that get put in place. Um, again, a series of laws, and the Displaced Persons Act, 48, 50, Refugee Act, 53, 57. How does that kind of complicate and make easier the ways in which, um, and, and, and let's speak specifically about Italian uh, immigration, uh, how folks can get around um, the various restrictions given these ideas of displaced persons and refugees? And, and I know, you know through the book and, and through other sources, uh, Italian Americans are really working the system, so to speak. Yes. Yes. So if World War I helps critics of immigration to pass more restrictive laws, 17, 21, and 24, World War II does the opposite, right? Uh, because the position of the United States has changed. The rhetoric that the United States projects about itself is different, right? It presents itself as a, a pluralistic society, democratic, inclusive. And so a lot of allies and critics say, well, there's a gap between what you say and the reality. And so the United States are kind of forced into changing uh, their laws. But this is, I think, where things get interesting. So no, on one hand, everyone, even someone like McCarran, who doesn't like immigration, understands that for geopolitical reasons, U.S. immigration laws can no longer be so blatantly discriminatory. But they also become creative in the ways where they're not saying, well, we don't, we still don't want certain immigrants. So the Refugee Acts and the uh, Displaced Persons Act are a really good example, right? So they essentially create class requirements for refugees, right? So it's like, we don't admit all refugees. We prefer the highly educated with means, which is terrible if you think about it. Despite the fact that refugees after World War II are all over the world, they overwhelmingly focus on helping European refugees. And that's where Italians become extremely creative. And because these definitions are still very fluid, so who is a displaced person, who is a refugee, um, it's not entirely clear. And so Italians coming back from their colonies, for example, from former Italian colonies, try to get in into the United States through the Displaced Persons Act or the Refugee Act, 
right? Even though in reality, that doesn't necessarily reflect their status. Um, and this is actually, you also see the limitation of uh, what Jewish activists could do because they are the ones who orchestrated the push for legislation to help Displaced Persons Act and refugees. But they can't say this is primarily for Jews who survived the Holocaust, right? They have to frame it in broader terms. And in the end, if you look at the numbers, Christian refugees actually arrived, uh, were admitted under those laws in higher numbers than um, Jewish refugees. And a lot of them were uh, Italians. And those Italians arrived, and then they sent for their families, right? I mean, and then the laws start complementing each other, right? So it's very clear in the 50s especially that what matters for Italians is it's, it's a family investment. One needs to go in, successfully enter the U.S., and then you have this quote-unquote chain migration, right, uh, that are replicated again. From your book, uh, the quota um, during the 50s, right, um, is uh, 5,666, right. and the total who arrived between 51 and 1960 were 185,491. Yes. If in uh, 1917 the strong relationship that Italians had with Italy was a liability, right? It was a clear mark of their inability to assimilate and become American. All of a sudden, in uh, World War II, but especially in the 1950s, this strong connection that Italians still have with Italy is an asset for the American government. And that's why you have a lot of uh, um, representatives and senators that start proposing bills. They don't all pass specifically focusing on Italians. It's because the United States realizes that Italy is kind of key to the Cold War balance in Europe. So the American Committee of Italian Migration makes a big deal out of saying, if we don't help, Italy will go communist. Do we really want to do this? So how do we get from all these restrictions to 1965? And what is the role that Jews and Italian Americans play in that, that law? And maybe you could tell us what happens with that law as well. Italians and Jews and other activists learn two big things from what happened during World War II and the early 1950s. Um, one is a coalition's actually work. Uh, no one comes away entirely happy with the legislations that get passed, but any change is better than the status quo. So by 1952, they really embraced this idea, right, that any small change is progress. But then they also understand the power of keeping the issue of immigration alive within uh, the broader public. Those are the two things that they embrace. And, and then uh, in the 1960s, when Kennedy is elected, people have such high hopes. It's like, this is it. Kennedy is now paying attention. Kennedy is very much focused outward, outside the United States, rather than on uh, immigration. And then everyone, as tragic as it is, realizes that once Johnson becomes president, both after the assassination and then in 64, that that is the very short window that might allow from serious immigration reform. They organize a bigger coalition. They organize nationwide speaking tours, uh, publishing of uh, newspaper articles, interviews about the, the need, the profound need that the country has to get rid of the last vestige of uh, discrimination in US immigration policies. And so if you stop there, Right? These two groups were extremely successful. They were very successful in pressuring the White House and a very, very reluctant Johnson to take up immigration reform, but they really had no influence or power into what the final law looked like. In, uh, I guess, a legislative masterpiece, people who were still in favor of immigration restrictions say, we will eliminate the national origins quota system but we will make it global, including the Western Hemisphere, which had been exempted. So all of a sudden now, even North America and South America, Latin America, they're all under. And, they, and, and it's interesting because they say, you want everyone to be equal. So they promote a really misleading idea of equality, right? So well done, all immigrants have to be under the same cap. The 1965 Act actually changed the United States quite a bit demographically, 
made the United States much more diverse, but it also, because of this false idea of equality, created a spike in undocumented immigration. They really thought that the law would encourage more Europeans to come. They hadn't figured out that things in Europe were changing. And in fact, the law ended up attracting more immigrants from uh, um, Asia and um, Africa. But at the same time, you have uh, people from the Americas who could until recently travel back and forth fairly freely, who are now under a quota. One of the things that your book does so wonderfully is that it allows us to see who these players are, right? These activists are. Um, uh, when all too often the history is is um, kind of leaves those those communities out of the conversation about how they um, how they fought back, how they struggled against these um, these various acts to limit um, uh, immigration. Why is it important, right, in 2020 to be looking at what was going on all the way back in the 1880s? I always tell my students, history doesn't repeat itself. It builds on itself. The attack on immigration today is possible only because it comes from a long history of legislative and bureaucratic changes uh, and compromises where, where these groups are part of that um, have over a hundred years uh, history, right? But I also think it's important now, as we look for ways to move forward, to know what has worked and what hasn't, right? To understand that um, coalition work is perhaps the way to go. They all come at immigration from very different perspectives. They have very different experience. It matters if you're white or if you're not. It matters if you came in as a refugee or as an immigrant. Uh, your class background matters. but. They try, they did their best to find common ground. The incredible, incredible hope that these people had that Americans would understand if only they knew. That hasn't changed. And their, their efforts to frame the issue as broadly as possible, not to be singled out, right, like Jews did, but by doing that, um, I think it's, it's, it's a risk because especially now, um, there are a lot of different immigrant groups and immigrants in the country that are here under very different conditions, right? Um, I mean, the legal versus um, unauthorized was not as strong 100 years ago, and now it is. I just want to thank you again for this, this opportunity to uh, chat with you today. Thank you so much for inviting me. This was an absolute pleasure. Thanks for watching this episode of Italics. I'm Anthony Tamburri. Arrivederci alla prossima puntata.